Hi, it's always fascinating when you see a high-flying company held by high-profile investors crash and burn. In the last few weeks, we've seen it happen with Valiant, a drug company that seemed to reinvent the drug business, a new way of doing business that seemed to work. So let's set the table. Valiant is a Canadian company that until about five years ago, most of us probably hadn't heard of. Starting about five years ago, you saw the company go into a deep percent, and you can see that in this graph. Revenue started shooting up, operating income went up, the company's market cap increased. And the question is, how did it pull this off? How did it take a business where most companies were stuck in neutral and go into hyperdrive? The answer, of course, was Valiant grew through a lot of acquisitions. Unlike most drug companies that grow through R&D, Valiant's mode for growth was to buy companies. And you can start seeing that in 2010. It did about 10, 12, 15 acquisitions per year. And most of these acquisitions were small and paid for with cash, but there were a couple of very big ones. One was of Bausch & Lomb, a private business. The other was of Salix, Salix Pharmaceuticals earlier this year, a public company. But all of these acquisitions were paid for with cash, which raises an interesting follow-up question. Where did Valiant come up with all this cash? The answer is in this pie, is in this pie chart. They did some stock issuances. About 15% of the funds came from, from stock issuances. About 19% from internal uh, funds, which is a retained earnings put in. The rest was borrowed. There again, they were breaking away from the conventional drug company, which tended to be primarily equity funded and borrowed very little. So over this period, Valiant built itself up by acquiring other companies, borrowing most of the money it needed for these acquisitions, and the market loved it. The market price for the company shot up, its market cap went up to 80, 90 billion, the stock price was at 250, and the investor base it accumulated was an interesting one. It was composed of a lot of value investors. I mean, nobody's fools. Here we're talking about people like Bill Ackman and the Sequoia Fund, investors who invested in companies that they claimed were undervalued, and Valiant was able to pass that test. That made its fall from grace so much more shocking. In the last few year, few weeks, you've seen Valiant. In fact, in about three weeks, Valiant's stock price has essentially lost about 60% of its, uh, of its value. The question is, what happened? The trigger was a news story that came out about a, a court case in California uh, where, a, where a, pharmaceutical, a pharmacy called R&O Pharmacy had sued to get money back. And he's saying, what's this got to do with Valiant? But that lawsuit kind of unfolded. And as it unfolded, it turned out that Valiant's fingerprints were all over. That triggered a wave of reports from short sellers in the company. Not the most reliable source on, on bad news about a company, because obviously they have a vested interest, telling you, you know, claiming that this was just a surface, that there was, there was more stuff coming out, more scandals that would put Valiant's value at risk. In fact, they used the word that this was the next Enron, that the company was a gigantic accounting concoction ready to come apart. Now, now both sides of, the, of, the, uh, of this picture paint a very different picture of the company. Valiant's managers came back and defended themselves, saying, no, no, this is an overreaction. We do have this ownership in, the, in a pharmacy, Philidor, and it's, it's, it's completely you know, above. It, it's completely legal. It's, it's all OK. And of course, the short seller said, we don't believe you. So I, I thought it would make sense to take a step back and look at the Valiant business model. And what is it that made it successful in the first place? In other words, what made it so attractive as an investment? And then look at whether they can go back to that model, assuming the scandal blows over. As I see, there are four big components to the Valiant business model. The first is, just as investors are told to buy low and sell high, Valiant brought that strategy, at least in my, from my perspective, into its acquisitions. It bought companies which had underpriced drugs, drugs which could be priced higher, that they were pricing too low. It bought these companies, and one of its strategies was pushing up the price, pushing up the price to what the market would bear. I'm not going to go into the morality and the ethical issues here, but that was a core component of their strategy. That is why Valiant was ranked highest among the pharmaceutical companies in terms of price increases on drugs that it essentially repriced. Second, unlike other drug companies, and I mentioned this earlier, Valiant was unafraid to borrow money. And in fact, you could argue that it was doing the right thing, that these companies are cash machines and they should be borrowing more money. Third, Valiant seemed to take the view that R&D is not sacred. And that's, you know, that's true. It treated R&D like any other investment. It said, we'll invest in R&D if it pays off. So it seemed to take a much more skeptical look at R&D than most pharmaceutical companies. And fourth, 
Unlike many acquisitive companies, they wait and will show you the effect on earnings. Valued seem to be very quick in converting acquisitions to earnings. Partly because if it's a price increase that's driving up earnings, it's going to be much easier to do. So those are the four central components. And in a sense, they explain <clears throat> why value investors were so attracted to the company. It, it cut to the core of how they thought about investing. And they said, that's a good idea when you do acquisitions to bring that same philosophy into your acquisitions. What's happened? I think this scandal has put the entire business model at risk. Each component of its of Valiant's business model is now questionable. Let's take each component. Let's start with the repricing component. I have no moral or ethical reasons for arguing against Valiant repricing its drugs. So you could argue that if you have sick people, maybe you shouldn't reprice it, but it's legal. But here's the problem. They also operate in a business that on the surface looks like a free market, but is actually a fairly regulated market. Regulated in what sense? Value negotiates with insurance companies and indirectly with the government when it sets these prices. And if it's going to increase prices, therefore it has to do it under the radar. Now that it's front and center and everybody knows about it, not only is it going to be more difficult to increase prices in the future, I think it might be forced to roll back prices on some of the drugs it's repriced. That's just my view, but I think that strategy of acquiring companies and repricing drugs is now history. Second, I think Valiant used its distribution network, which is this convoluted network of pharmacies, not to play accounting games like the short sellers claimed, but to basically maximize the prices it could get for drugs. I have a feeling that, that Valiant used this network to essentially shop around to see which parts of the country, which insurance companies would pay the highest price for drugs and used it to maximize prices. Again, nothing illegal about it, but now that that network is, is up front and you can see what's in there, I have a feeling that it's either going to be made illegal or tightly regulated, making it more difficult to do what Valiant did until a few months ago. Third. As an acquisitive company, Valiant has accumulated a lot of accounting debris. Debris in what sense? Well, you've seen the Goodwill item climb from $3 billion to $17.4 billion. It's now about 36% of all the assets on, good, on Valiant's balance sheet is this useless accounting asset that nobody can quite tell me what it stands for. With goodwill comes the amortization, the impairment of goodwill and, and intangibles. So basically, because Valiant has been acquiring so many intangible assets in goodwill, that impairment charge climbs as well, and you're not quite sure what that impairment charge is. You also have restructuring charges that come with acquisitions, and again, a bigger and bigger charge each year. My point is that many of these accounting charges have made Valiant's financial statements difficult to read. In the good days, basically, Valiant could just add back all these expenses and it's a trust us. They're just accounting expenses. They'll go away. Now, I'm not so sure. In fact, that brings me to my final point. Valiant has built a really complicated company. Some of this comes from their business, to, uh, business model, the acquisitions and dealing with acquisitions, but some of it is by choice. The use of chess terms to, 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 to describe some of their holdings. So, so clearly, some of this complexity is by design. And complexity, in my view, is a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword because in the good times, what people don't know about you, they attribute the best of intentions to you and give you value. In bad times, like right now, what they don't know becomes scary and they attribute the worst of all possible motives to you. So that complexity, in a sense, is blowing back in their faces. And to give you an example of how complex they are as a company, their last 10K was 537 pages. I'm not saying that that's all their fault, but that's a, that's a messy company to work with. So I decided to value Valiant as a going concern on the assumption that they could not go back to their acquisition-driven model. Now, if you take out the acquisition-driven model, you take out the 20% growth they've been able to post over the last five years. So what I'm assuming in my valuation is that Valiant is going to become a more traditional pharmaceutical company. And there's some good news and bad news. The good news is that a traditional pharmaceutical company, they will not have to do acquisitions. They don't have to reinvest as much. The bad news is they will now have to do R&D and their growth rate is going to drop to that of a mature pharmaceutical company, which right now is about 2 to 3%. I'm also going to assume, and this might just be pessimistic on me because I'm right in the middle of, of the scandal, that there's going to be some pricing rollback because there's so much the focus of attention. Some of those Salix drugs that they were planning to push up the price, they might have to hold back on. So I'm going to assume a 10% drop in operating income because of that repricing. Now, I've been, after I put this valuation up, people from both sides have accused me of either being over-optimistic or over-pessimistic. So I'm going to put the spreadsheet up 
as a link to this YouTube session and you can play with the numbers you don't this is my valuation and based on my valuation I get a value of about 72 it is true that the trailing 12 month numbers that I used included only six months of consolidated numbers for Salix so there's more Salix stuff to come out and there's there's an argument to be made that the revenue should be higher and the operating income should be higher because of that I tried adding that on I get to about 80 81 dollars per share if I do that but whatever I do I'm getting to the conclusion that even if I am optimistic as I think I'm being here um, I can't I know the stock is a fair value stock at best it's not a massively undervalued stock in spite of the price drop I've seen people throwing around numbers like 175, 200, 400 for, for value. Night, I don't get it. I, I really don't see how you get there with the stuff that has happened to them. So the bottom line is that Valiant, as a going concern, is probably worth only about $75 to $80. If you buy into my assumptions, maybe with more optimistic assumptions, you could get up to $100, $110 per share. <clears throat> but here's something to think about. Maybe this scandal will taint Valiant so much that there is another option that they have to consider. Tainted in what sense? If Valiant becomes a company that is untouchable, so basically untouchable as a commercial enterprise that you want to deal with, insurance companies don't want to deal with you, <coughs> regulators treat you as a, a, as a corporate bad citizen, there is another thing that Valiant might want to consider. Just as it built itself up piece by piece by acquiring other companies, it might find that the best value strategy for itself is to break itself up and sell off those pieces to somebody else who is not tainted, who is willing to pay more for Bausch & Long or for Salix Pharmaceuticals or the drugs that you've acquired over time. And that's something to think about. I'm not saying it's going to be easy because the managers who built up Valiant will find it very difficult to let go of what made them successful. But as an investor in Valiant, if I became an investor, this might be one option that becomes a more attractive option. I hope you've enjoyed the session. But please, do try to value Valiant on, on your own. Don't take my valuation as the valuation. This is your investment to make, and you have to make your own decisions. Thank you very much for listening.